The History of the Electric Guitar In this documentary, we'll be taking a brief look at the history of the electric guitar, spanning from the early 20th century to the modern day. Before we start talking about the electric guitar itself, we have to understand why it came to be. Anyone who plays acoustic guitar knows the instrument isn't exactly the loudest. With the advent of big band music in the 20s, the only way to really be heard was to strum with a pick. This restricted the guitar to the rhythm roll. To solve the problem of volume, people tried placing microphones in front of the guitars. This was sadly to little avail, as it only resulted in screeching feedback. Feedback, for those who don't know, is when the output of a microphone starts flowing back into itself, creating a never-ending cycle, which results in a high-pitched squeal. The microphones had to be set up very sensitively to fully capture the guitar, which was ideal for feedback. With the high demand for an amplified counterpart, guitar manufacturers got cracking. The attempts to amplify stringed instruments had been going on since the early 20th century. In the 1910s, telephone transmitters had been placed inside acoustic bodies like violins to amplify them. In the 20s, attempts were made to amplify guitars by placing carbon button microphones on the bridge to amplify vibrations. This didn't last long either, due to the output simply being too low. Due to the multitude of inventions, it's nigh impossible to assign the electric guitar's invention to one person. The earliest instrument to really resemble electric guitars as we know them today, and the first instrument to be sold commercially, was the 1932 frying pan. The instrument was created by George Beauchamp and Paul Barth under the National Guitar Corporation. Although it was a lap steel and not a guitar, it still bore many important revolutions. Most importantly, the magnetic pickup, which reduced feedback massively. Adolf Rickenbacker. D don't, uh, don't worry, he was Swiss. And born before the other one. Anyways, back to the point. Adolf Rickenbacker is one of the most important names in the history of the electric guitar. Alongside Beauchamp and Bath, Rickenbacker helped co-produce the frying pan, and was one of the heads of the National Guitar Corporation, which in 1934 renamed itself to Rickenbacker. Now that's a name you're probably more familiar with. After the success of the frying pan, the three got to work on a new line of electric guitars that had a hollow body, and used the same single coil magnetic pickup that the frying pan had used. Alas, the electric guitar was born. Rickenbacker is widely considered to be the first manufacturer of the electric guitar, and was the first company to patent the design in 1937. Rickenbacker guitars are still popular to this day, and are mainly used in the genres of country and soft rock, and have been wielded by players like John Fogerty, Tom Petty, and various members of the Beatles. With the success of Rickenbacker's hollow body guitars, other manufacturers weren't far behind. Legendary acoustic manufacturer Gibson followed up in 1936 with the Electric Spanish Series 150, or more commonly known as the S150. The 150 representing the $150 the instrument sold for at the time. If only times hadn't changed, wait, let, let me go and check this. Holy Jesus! Well, I think they might have to consider renaming it now. Anyways, back to the point. The basic design of a hollow body electric guitar is comprised of an acoustic body with pickups in the place of the traditional sound hole and F holes on the guitar's sides. And of course an input jack on the side so that you can actually plug the instrument into an amplifier. These guitars, although being a massive improvement on previous iterations, still bore the issue of feedback at high volumes or high gain. To mitigate this, guitar manufacturers sometimes opted to make the body's wood thicker. Out of the desire to further reduce feedback, a whole new model was devised, the semi-hollow body. These guitars had a solid piece of wood running through the middle of the body to further reduce the hollow space. Semi-hollow bodies are still used to this day, but mainly in the genres of jazz, country, blues, and soft rock as the design reacts poorly to high amounts of gain or distortion. These guitars have been used by legends such as Mike Campbell, the Three Kings of Blues, Chuck Berry, John Lennon, Glenn Fry, and Chet Atkins, just to name a few.
Now that we've talked about semi-hollow bodies and hollow bodies, let's rewind a little and go back to the 1920s, where we find a man by the name of Les Paul. The name Les Paul is one of, if not the most important names in the electric guitar's history. Les Paul was an extremely popular jazz and country guitarist throughout the 50s. Beside his stellar career as a guitarist, Les was also a luthier and inventor on the side. As a young lad, Les had already been experimenting with his musical gear. He at one point discovered he could use phone parts to amplify his singing and harmonica. The issue of his guitar's volume still remained, however and he reckoned he could earn more money in tips if the patrons at the outer ends of the venues he played at could hear him better. He tried applying the same concept he used for his vocals to his guitar, but yet again ran into the issue of feedback, and realised that the guitar's hollow body was the issue. After applying his pickup system to a solid piece of steel, he received no feedback and exceptional sustain. Problem was, Les knew, if he'd walk on stage with a metal guitar, he'd scare off his audience. So he stopped pursuing the idea, until he eventually came back to it in the 1930s. Les still had the same two goals in mind, to build a solid body guitar out of wood that would sustain longer and have better tone than any of the contemporary hollow body designs. Enter Les Paul's log. He built the guitar out of a solid slab of pine wood and equipped it with his homemade pickups and tremolo system. The guitar sounded and played exactly like Les had envisioned, but yet again, Audiences weren't all that receptive to a guitar that looked like a piece of wood. In order to fix the guitar's appearance, he attached two ends of an Epiphone guitar to the log's side, giving it a more conventional look. The guitar was a success for Les personally, and served him throughout his career. That screw down there, it, uh, it resembles a guitar. It's telling you it's a guitar. After Les Paul's newfound success with his log, he approached the legendary guitar manufacturer Gibson with his creation, to little avail. Folks over at Gibson quite literally likened it to a broomstick with pickups. It was only in the 50s when Gibson caught wind of Leo Fender's broadcaster, which we'll hear about later, that they decided to act. The company urgently worked together with Les to pump out a solid body guitar of their own. In 1952, Gibson eventually released what would be one of, if not the most iconic electric guitars, and with that the most popular signature model of all time. The Gibson Les Paul. The original guitar was released with a gold finish, also referred to as a gold top, with a pair of P90 pickups, P90s being thicker wound single coil pickups. It was only in 1957 that the guitar was available with humbucking pickups, humbuckers being two single coil pickups in sequence. The advantage of these pickups being the higher output and reduced noise, hence the name humbucker. In 1958, the guitar was also available in its iconic sunburst finish. The models from this year are widely considered to be the best in the guitar's history, by many artists and collectors alike. Guitars from this year, if well kept, sell for upwards of $10,000 a piece. Despite the guitar's brilliant innovations, sales didn't fare too well, and the guitar was replaced with the Gibson SG. The guitar eventually found its way back into production in 1968 and has stayed in production ever since. The guitar has since obtained legendary status, thanks to its wide usage in many genres, from hard rock and heavy metal, to jazz and reggae. The guitar has been wielded by countless legends, such as Slash, Jimmy Page, Billy Gibbons, Mark Knopfler, Eric Clapton, Don Felder, Jeff Beck, Buckethead, Joe Walsh, Zach Wilde, and Bob Marley. Just to name a few, there are so many great Les Paul players, the list is basically infinite. Despite its prolonged popularity, the guitar still bears a couple of design flaws, all of which are manifested in the guitar's headstock. Although the slanted angle does look pretty sick, it's less than ideal from a design standpoint. First point being, if the guitar is to be placed on the floor, it would be propped up on its headstock, meaning if the guitar is dropped on its back, it's very susceptible to breaking or snapping right off. The other problem with the slanted angle being the reduced tuning stability, Many models suffer from terrible tuning stability if the nut isn't well lubricated and isn't cut all too well. The strings tend to cut or get stuck in the nut. The reason people put up with these things is because the guitar sounds and plays phenomenally. Now to talk about the aforementioned broadcaster. Whilst Les Paul had been trying to convince Gibson to realise his vision, somewhere in a garage in Fullerton, California, 
Leo Fander had been tinkering about with different guitar designs until finally creating the first prototype of the Broadcaster. The guitar consisted of two main pieces, the solid wood body and the second being the bolted on neck, which despite making the guitar a little less playable due to the right angle, it reduced the production costs massively and allowed for easier mass production. The idea behind the guitar being that an artist on the road could repair the guitar much more easily by switching out different parts like the neck, instead of having to buy an entirely new guitar. The guitar was originally released under the name Broadcaster, but was quickly halted due to legal actions by Gretsch, who had already trademarked the name Broadcaster. Fender, in response, scraped the Broadcaster sticker off all the guitars they had in stock, and the guitar was for a short time known as the No-Caster, due to the missing sticker on the headstock. Fender also released the Fender Esquire, which was basically a Broadcaster with one pickup instead of two. Originally only 50 were produced, and were plagued by technical issues, due to the guitar not possessing a truss rod, which made it impossible to adjust the neck. The guitar was later introduced as a budget Telecaster. After all these blunders, the guitar was finally released as the Fender Telecaster, and is widely used to this day, predominantly in the genres of rock and country, and sometimes hard rock. The guitar has been used by players like Jimmy Page, Richie Coxon, Keith Richards, Joe Walsh, Jeff Buckley, and Bruce Springsteen, and remains a landmark in the electric guitar's development. After the Telecaster, Fender quickly followed up with the Fender Stratocaster, or more commonly known as the Strat. It's an absolutely monumental guitar, and probably the first guitar people think of when you say electric guitar. This is due to the guitar's immense popularity, and having the single most copied design in the world. The guitar was collaboratively designed by Leo Fender, Bill Carson, George Fullerton, and Freddie Tavison. At its release, it was the only guitar on the market to be equipped with a free pickup setup and a spring tension based tremolo or vibrato system. The free pickups allowed for excellent timbral diversity. The bridge and the neck pickup served basically the same purpose as on a Telecaster. The added middle pickup, though, gave a very neutral sound EQ wise and sounds almost like an acoustic guitar. With the introduction of the five way switch in later models, it allowed players to blend the different pickups together for even more tones. The tremolo system was a revolution in and of itself. It allowed for completely new playing styles to develop. The bridge could be set up in one of two modes, either floating or fixed. The floating mode allows you to move the pitch up and down, whilst the fixed mode only allows you to move the pitch downwards, the advantage of the fixed position being the improved tuning stability. The guitar was also fully contoured and had many comfort grooves. Combined with the double cutaway, the guitar was extremely comfortable to play. The double cutaway also made it a lot easier to access the upper frets. All these attributes come together beautifully. Many have called the guitar the most versatile in the world. Although I don't personally agree with the sentiment, I can understand it. The guitar's astounding versatility has made it popular in almost every genre from funk and reggae, to soul and hard rock. There is very little that a Strat can't do, which is why they've been used by almost everyone. For example, Eric Clapton, Jimi Hendrix, Buddy Holly, Stevie Ray Vaughan, Jeff Beck, Richie Blackmore, The Edge, John Frusciante, George Harrison, Mark Knopfler, Yngwie Malmsteen, John Mayer, and my personal favorite, David Gilmour. Like the Les Paul, the number of great Strat players is just endless. The Fender Strat is the foundation of many modern guitars, which is why it's managed to stay so incredibly relevant for so long. With the advent of heavy metal, guitarists needed something that could keep up with the ever-evolving sound of the genre. Players would usually just slightly modify Strats or Les Pauls, that all changed when a young guitarist by the name of Eddie Van Halen came along. The young musician envisioned a guitar that would combine both the sound of a Gibson with the playability of a Fender Strat. He started off with a plain boogie body's Strat knockoff body and neck, 
He only added a single humbucker to the bridge position, since he never really changed pickup configurations. He equipped the guitar with a Floyd Rose tremolo system, the advantage of which being the deeper vibrato, and the increased tuning stability, paired with a nut lock. With the strings being locked in between two points, they couldn't really move around like they could on a regular guitar, and could stay in tune for days at a time. Eddie specially requested fine tuners be added to the Floyd Rose tremolo system, so he could tune the guitar after the nut had been locked. Eddie gave the guitar a paint job that nowadays screams metal, but at the time, just screamed Van Halen. A modification he made, which isn't all too obvious, is an improvised strap lock system. The strap lock keeping the strap physically screwed on the guitar, massively reducing the chances of an accident. With all these modifications, the Frankenstrap was born. With Van Halen's massive success, some guitar manufacturers tried making replicas of Eddie's iconic guitar. In order to dissuade them, he kept making minute changes to the guitar, making it impossible to make an accurate replica. Nowadays, Eddie owns his own guitar company, EVH, and produces his signature guitar, and his signature amp, the 5150. The new guitar type was quickly dubbed the Super Strat. The idea being that it was a beefed up and more playable Strat. Super Strats are usually heavily adjusted to the individual artists, which is why there are many signature models, which also happen to be the most popular models. For example, Steve Vai's Ibanez Gem, with its unmistakable monkey grip, Damasio pickups, and in-your-face paint jobs. Or Sinister Gates' signature Schecht guitar that comes with a Sustainiac pickup. When turned on, you can basically hold the note forever if you have enough gain. The guitar also comes with a Seymour Duncan Invader pickup and has a pretty unique pinstripe paint job. On top of that, it also comes with a set neck which allows you to reach the higher frets very easily. Or you have the Music Man Majesty, which is what I would personally consider to be the most versatile guitar, over the Strat. As it not only has two humbucking pickups, but also a piezo system. For those who don't know what a piezo system is, it's basically a pickup system which is based on crystals that absorb vibrations, and then from the vibrations turns it into a signal. One can apply these piezo systems to basically any guitar, and it will sound like an acoustic guitar. The other good thing about the guitar is that it has a floating bridge, but doesn't actually have a locking nut, which makes the setup a lot easier, but it still stays in tune remarkably well. Another big advantage of the guitar is that it has a set neck. This, like with the Sinister Gate signature, allows for excellent high fret access. The satin finish also makes the guitar feel very nice and smooth, which makes it comfortable to play. Like a Stratocaster, this guitar also has a lot of comfort grooves, to be as ergonomic as possible. With Super Strats also came extended range guitars, which are guitars with additional lower strings. There are for example 7 strings, 8 strings, and for the absolute gentiest of boys, 9 string guitars. Another innovation would be the headless guitar. Headless guitars have no headstock, and are supposed to be easier to set up than a standard Floyd Rose guitar. And some people say that they hold tune better than a normal Floyd Rose. Me personally, I kind of dislike the look of a guitar without a headstock. Now for some more recent innovations. For example, the Acoustasonic Telecaster by Fender. This guitar aims to be the perfect middle ground between acoustic and electric guitars. By the looks of things, it's actually pretty good. It uses both a single coil and a piezo system, and can be mixed and matched with the five-way switch. The only downsides being that it's still pretty pricey as it's brand new, and the other thing being that it's got a hollow body, which, as we all know, with a lot of gain, will feed back. Also quite a recent innovation is Relish's lineup of guitars. The innovation with their guitars comes from the fact that you can open them on the back and quickly switch out pickups on the fly, allowing for an almost endless variety of timbres. My issue with the guitar is that it's extremely expensive for what it is. Although the price can somewhat be justified by being made in Switzerland and also being a brand new technology, I think that asking for 4,000 to 6,000 francs is a bit much. 
The other issue that I have is that I know which pickups I like, and I think I won't really be switching out more than one or two pickups, and I'll probably just stay on one pickup most of the time. I can see how it would be useful for a session guitarist, as he can basically switch from a metal tone to a jazz tone within seconds, but for the average consumer, I think it's a bit of a gimmick. Another thing that has to be taken into consideration is how much wood actually is scooped out of the guitar. The more wood you remove from a guitar, the brighter it gets and the more warmth it loses. But that's again up to taste if you like a warm or a bright sounding guitar. But all in all, even if we may be sceptical towards these technologies now, they'll probably evolve into something great in the future. Before completely finishing this documentary, I'd like to say thanks a lot for watching, and I'd like to close out the documentary with one of my favourite guitar solos on my favourite guitar.